Awesome. Well, uh, good morning, friends. As Jason said, my name is Zach, and it's my pleasure to serve as one of your pastors here at Covenant. If you are following along with this morning's scripture in your own Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is towards the end of the first half of the Bible, if you're just looking at the amount of pages. It's uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 that we'll be reading today, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. This is Nehemiah narrating uh, as he and the Jews are rebuilding the destroyed wall of Jerusalem. Sanballat became angry and was greatly incensed, and he ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they're building, even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. And then Nehemiah continues in prayer and says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders." And continuing in narration, Nehemiah says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are in this room right beside us, and you have called us to love you with our whole hearts, to offer our whole hearts to you. So help us as we hear from you to listen to your Holy Spirit as you speak to us through your word and to listen not because we want to gain something, but to listen because we love you. Let that be our purpose. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple days ago, my best friend David Hiley was walking through the store with his precious one-year-old baby girl, uh, and they walked past a lady who had three young boys. Uh, And one of the little boys looked at David's daughter, and he delivered the ultimate burn. I see some looks of confusion. A burn is an insult. Boom roasted. I just insulted you, and you didn't even realize it. Uh, This boy looks at this baby girl, and he delivers the ultimate insult, the ultimate burn, and he says, babies wear diapers. Oh, in your face, the ultimate burn. Everybody loves a good burn. How about this classic comedic trope of cinema, the ultimate super genius villain, And the bumbling sidekick. You know what I'm talking about. There's always a scene in the movie where the supervillain, who's uh, a genius, is delivering an epic monologue of evil brilliance in his plot, usually with the hero captive. Uh, And as soon as he's completing getting to the most uh, important point in his monologue of evil brilliancy, his bumbling sidekick opens his mouth and ruins the whole moment. You know, like... Like, think of your favorite Disney movie, The Lion King. You have Scar, the evil, poetic villain of genius strategy, and the three stupid hyenas, okay? Beauty and the Beast, you into princess movies? Gaston and LeFou, supervillain, idiot sidekick. You all know what I'm talking about. What you didn't realize is that this trope originated in the book of Nehemiah. And I just read it to you, and you still didn't realize it. Boom roasted. But it's okay. I, it took me a few times to get it as well. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. I want you to paint this picture in your minds for me. It says that Sanballat 
was a Samaritan leader, and he's gathered with the army of Samaria and his associates, the other leaders of Samaria. They're gathered together, and the Jews are here, and their city has been destroyed. More on that in a second, but they're trying to rebuild their wall, and he's gathered this super villain Sanballat in front of these evil armies of Samaria, and he delivers his epic monologue of insult. Picture this with me. He says, what are those feeble Jews doing? Yeah! Will they restore their wall? No! Will they offer sacrifices? No! Will they finish in a day? <laughs> yeah, right! Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? And here comes Tobiah, the bumbling sidekick, and he says, yeah, the, their wall's so dumb, if a, a fox climbed on it, it would fall down. Oh, got him. Ladies and gentlemen, the supervillain and the bumbling sidekick. Okay, so before we carry on with where we are in Nehemiah, let's back up about 140 years to see what kind of position they're in. 140 years prior, to get there, we're going to turn to 2 Kings chapter 24. And in 2 Kings chapter 24, the king of Babylon, his name is Nebuchadnezzar, has come with his armies to the city of Jerusalem, and he's come in, and he's brought destruction and devastation upon the city and the people. He's destroyed the temple and stolen the precious golden artifacts of the Lord and cut them in pieces. He's destroyed homes. I imagine that he, the, the armies took goods, took people's possessions, shoved people around. He slaughtered and murdered. And then he destroyed the wall on the city around the city. And then in verse 14, it says this. He, that's Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carried all Jerusalem, this is the people, into exile. Who did he take into exile? All the officers and the fighting men and all the skilled workers and the artisans. A total of 10,000, only the poorest people of the land were left. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Now, let's talk about the significance of what Nebuchadnezzar has just done to the people of Jerusalem. Not only did he take away all of the officers, the military officers, the people with experience conducting battle strategy, he also took all the fighting men. So if Israel wants to defend themselves, they must turn to civilians. But even worse than that, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed their wall and then plucked up in one fell swoop all of, it says, the skilled workers and the artisans. These are the people who are skilled in stonework to rebuild the wall, in carpentry to restore the gates, and the artisans are the, the, the designers and the architects who would come up with the plans for this. Now, this is very, very bad for the city of Jerusalem, and here's why. In 500 B.C., your group of people, your township, your area is not actually defined as a city unless you have a wall around it. And here's why. If you are a township of people and you have no city wall, you are not able to build up enough economic momentum to build up a commerce system that's worthy of being known as a city because you have no wall of defense and no advanced intelligence technology to warn you of an oncoming attack. So as soon as you begin to build up enough resources to be even considered known as a city, the neighboring nations can come and just wipe you out. And so a city wall is actually what transitions a group of people from being just a family gathering or some neighbors, farming neighbors, and becomes a city because with the wall of defense, you are prepared for attack. 
uh, without advanced intelligence tech, most attacks, I'm assuming, were like ambushes, right? They're surprises. You, you don't, maybe you see them coming for a day uh, if you had some scouts out, but you don't have much advance notice. And so that wall was the one thing that kept you from being wiped out in a moment's notice. And not only do the Jews have no city wall, they also have no one who can rebuild the city and no one who can defend them. And the only people left in Jerusalem are the poorest people in all the land. Fast forward to the book of Nehemiah. This is, again, we're going forward about 140 years. And the people of Jerusalem, this is generations of the poorest in the land with no city wall, no armies, no commerce. And let's check in with them and see what's going on. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah is narrating, starting in verse 2, he says, Hanani, one of my brothers, came uh, with some other men from Judah, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Brother Hanani, tell me of our Jewish brothers and sisters, how are the people doing? And what of the city? Any news? And they said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And Nehemiah says that when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah hears the plight of his Jewish brothers and sisters, and he's overcome with grief, imagining what life must have been like for them for the last 140 years. Picture this. You have no wall. You have no one who's scary enough to keep people from attacking you. The neighboring uh, nations, what's to stop them from coming in whenever they want? Oh, you've, you've managed to grow some food. Thank you. I'll take that. By the way, where are the city's women? We'd like to, to have our way with them. Oh, you've built yourself a shelter. What if I just kick it over? And Nehemiah is imagining what might have been going on for these people and the oppression that they may have been facing. And he's overcome and falls to the ground where he is and weeps. And it says that he mourns and fasts and prays for days. But Nehemiah doesn't just pray for justice. Nehemiah gets up and he does justice. And he goes to the king. The king, this is time for another sermon, another day, but King Artaxerxes notices how overcome with grief Nehemiah is, and he says, what's wrong? And Nehemiah tells him and makes his request, and the king, praise God, actually sends Nehemiah back to Jerusalem with uh, resources, with helpers, with letters of protection to rebuild the city wall. And so Nehemiah goes forward to do justice. That word justice is what this morning's message is about. Now, before you respond and react, a couple of foundational statements about what justice is. This morning, we are not talking about your modern definition of justice, and we are not talking about political justice in the slightest. So I want you to cast out whatever definition of justice that you came in here this morning with and be prepared for a biblical definition of justice. This morning we're painting with a broad brush about God's heart for justice and our responsibility as Christians to do justice. And then we'll focus in to a specific area where we are called to do justice. 
So this is the biblical definition and case for justice in our responsibility. Micah 6, 8 says that what the Lord requires of his people is to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In the Bible, there are two Hebrew words that are used and translated as the English word justice. Two words. The first one is the word mishpat. Mishpat. Mishpat is speaking to the judgment for the oppressor side of justice. When, when the Bible uses the word mishpat, it's talking about doing justice by bringing uh, retribution upon the oppressor. And the other word that's described is the word tzedakah. And tzedakah is talking about restoration for the oppressed. Restoration for the oppressed. Mishpat and tzedakah. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, God says that the reason he chose Abraham to be the father of his people Israel is because Abraham will lead his family line to do mishpat and tzedakah to bring judgment upon the oppressors and to restore the oppressed. And by so doing this, he will be keeping the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is to do justice and to love mercy. And so, as the church, we do have a responsibility for mishpat, but I'm not talking about that this morning. This morning, I'm talking about our responsibility as Christians to do tzedakah. Tzedakah is literally translated as righteous acts of justice, restoration for the oppressed. God's heart for tzedakah is such that in the law of Moses, he actually commands the people of Israel, when they are when they are harvesting their crops, the farmers, they are to intentionally leave behind some of their crop unharvested. But what about all this hard work I did for this crop? Leave behind some of it unharvested. That doesn't make any sense. Why? Well, not only that, but when you're harvesting grain, fruits, and vegetables, if you drop some on the ground, you're supposed to leave it there. Why? It's perfectly good. Five-second rule. God commanded the people of Israel to leave behind some of their produce unharvested so that the poor and the widow and actually the foreigner can come through and benefit from the hard work of the farmer. And this is because we in the family of God have a responsibility to do tzedakah for the poor and the oppressed. How about the New Testament? If, if you read Matthew 25, you hear Jesus' heart for Zedekiah. He says, uh, he says that those who fed the hungry, those who clothed the naked, when they did this, they were not only just doing good deeds for the poor and the oppressed, the hungry and the naked, they were doing these deeds for Jesus himself. As you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And in James chapter 1, verse 27, the brother of Jesus writes that religion that is pure and undefiled before our Father in heaven is to care for the widow and the orphan and to keep oneself from becoming polluted by the world. Biblical justice, the definition of biblical justice, is to take an active response to the plight of the poor and the oppressed. And maybe you're asking, well, sure, I can get behind that, but what if they don't deserve it? What if they put themselves in that plight? And my final piece of evidence for you is that the gospel is a gospel of justice for the undeserving of tzedakah for the undeserving. When Jesus came to earth and died on the cross, Jesus bore the mishpat, the judgment for the oppressor of God on his own shoulders so that you might enjoy the tzedakah, the restoration of the poor and the oppressed and the needy. 
while we were yet sinners, before we deserved it, we never deserved it, Christ died for us. The gospel is a message of justice. But friends, there's a travesty of injustice happening all across the globe and even in the United States and even in this very neighborhood each and every day. Maybe you've walked past it. Uh, I'm sure you've walked past it, actually. Maybe you realized it. Maybe you didn't. Here's a statistic from the Global Slavery Index. Today in the United States, there are over 500,000 women being trafficked for sex. And from the same source, as of the year 2018, human trafficking was the second most profitable organized crime in the world, netting $150 billion every single year. <laughs> These girls who are in this evil machine of human trafficking were vulnerable and weak. The statistics show that most of them were carrying around a heart wound that made them believe, I am not deserving of love. And no one loves me. And then the wicked predators spot them out so easily. And they come and they say, I'll show you love. You can be loved by me, and it's not love. But these vulnerable and easily manipulated young women and girls get sucked into the world of human trafficking. And the saddest part is they have really no hope. According to what we know from the FBI and Homeland Security, less than 1% of the trafficked women in the world ever escape from their trafficker. Let that sink in. Less than 1% ever escape. These women have no hope. But here's the thing. Law enforcement knows exactly where thousands of these women are, knows who their traffickers are, and has the manpower to move to rescue, but they won't. Why? Over 99% of trafficked women who are quote-unquote rescued within 48 hours are either in prison or back with their trafficker. Why is that? Well, about 10 years ago, there was an FBI agent who was working to fight against sex trafficking and in the cycle of exploitation, and he was sharing with a small group from church his frustration and despair over feeling like he wasn't making a difference. And his small group said, well, what can we do? And he began to pray and study and research, and he found the pinch point, the chokehold that Satan has in this industry. And the reason these women end back up with their trafficker is because there is a grave absence of available tier three safe homes. So when it comes to safe homes for slavery victims, tier one is a place to stay for 24 to 48 hours, bed, food, clothes. Tier two is a 30-ish day program uh, to detox from the drugs that you've been subjected to, forced into becoming addicted to so that you can remain in their control, uh, to detox from that and sort of get your head clear as much as you can in 30 days. But a tier three safe home is a one to two year whole person rehabilitation program where these women can go and receive medical care, psychiatric treatment, operate in a community, 
learn job skills. And so this FBI agent in his small group did something amazing. They felt a call to do justice, and they said, we're going to do something about it. And they started an organization called AMIRA. And AMIRA is a Tier 3 safe home located in Boston, Massachusetts. Their program, women usually stay with them for anywhere from one to two years, includes healing in the categories of physical healing, psychological, emotional, social, vocational, and spiritual healing. Listen to this good news. Uh, the women who go through Amira's program in their nine years of existence have an 80% success rate. What does a success look like for Amira? It looks like a woman, a human being, who is able to find whole person healing such that she's able to re-enter society as a high-functioning, independent adult who can operate in community, who can hold down a job, and who has hope for the future of her life. Here's a couple of testimonies from survivors that have been through Amira's program. This unknown anonymous survivor writes, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I just turned 40 years old, and I have two beautiful, amazing daughters, a preteen and a teenager. Amira has helped me be able to be in their lives again after not seeing them for about four years. I've been living at the Amira house for close to two years. There are so many good things that I've been blessed with since I've been here. I want to tell you how I'm doing now. I have two years and two months clean. I have a job that I like and I'm good at. I spend time with my family regularly. And now I actually look forward to the future. The Amira staff and volunteers are like my second family. They have given me grace, love, and support when others wouldn't. Hear this beautiful statement from this woman. She says, I am really proud of myself. From no self-esteem, being owned, used, and abused day in and day out, to hope for the future, and proud of herself. And I am so very grateful for Amira and everyone who keeps it going. Thank you. Here's another testimony from a survivor. I speak for myself when I say the kind of quote-unquote love that I have known my whole life was not really love. It's a weird feeling to receive unconditional love, but I am so grateful for it. My hope is for everyone in my situation to get an opportunity like I did because Amira is special and there is no other place like it. If it can change my life, it can change someone else's. Praise God for the life that is being given through the ministry of Amira. Now, at this point, if you're asking yourself, well, why should I support a ministry from Texas that's located in New England? There's two reasons why I personally believe that we in this room and online should support this ministry called Amira. Reason number one, their whole person rehabilitation program is so good that in the year 2018, the United Nations recognized their program as being the best slavery to freedom recovery program in the entire world. That's from the UN. Reason number two, Amira is the only tier three safe home to ever try and replicate their model. Hear this, in the year 2019, Amira decided that we are not going to keep this in one location. We're going to multiply, replicate, and plant a new Tier 3 safe home in the state of Connecticut. And this is all part of a vision for building a worldwide network of Tier 3 safe homes. They have partners across the globe. They have partners across the United States who are all on board with this vision for the mission of building a network of healing of Tier 3 safe homes, and their Connecticut safe home is on track to open in the year 2021. Praise God. About five years ago is when I first came to this church. 
and I fell in love with it very quickly. And here's why. The preaching was okay. Boom roasted. Just kidding. The preaching's awesome when Jason preaches. Uh, the worship was awesome. But even more importantly than those two factors, I fell in love with you, the people. Church, you are a generous church. Time in and time out, I have seen you respond to the plight of the poor and the needy by saying, how much? But more than gifts of generosity, offerings of generosity, I've seen you offer your time, your sweat, your energy, sacrificing of your own life on behalf of the poor and the oppressed, and it's such a beautiful thing, and that's why I love this church. I'm honored to be one of your pastors, and I want you to hear me when I say this. Your Father in heaven is so proud of you. He's so proud of you. And that's why this morning I'm so excited to offer you a chance to respond on behalf of the oppressed in a new way. The week of July 12th to the 18th is Move for Amira week. What is Move for Amira? Move for Amira is a fundraiser uh, that's based upon the principle that recovering from being used and abused for years of your life, owned by another person, is really, really hard. It's really, really hard. And so in solidarity, the week of July 12th, we are going to get out there and, uh, and sweat it out uh, to work hard to raise money for the ministry and the work that's happening for these women at Amira. Now, this is how Move for Amira works. Each person will pick a movement that is fun for them, something they like to do or something that's a challenge, running, biking, swimming, uh, and then a distance goal. And a fundraising goal. And then during the, the week of July 12th, you'll accomplish your movement goal. Uh, and all the funds raised go to support the work and ministry being done at Amira. So I have two opportunities for you to respond today. The first is if you're interested in doing your own Move for Amira goal, I would love to get you set up with the means to do that. Uh, so see me after church. Send me an email, Zach at covenantconnects.com. Org. I will get you set up to move for a mirror yourself. The second opportunity is I'm giving you the invitation to support my move for a mirror challenge. Um, so what I'm doing, it's, uh, it's a little unique. It's not your normal move goal. I am doing a reverse sled drag. What that means is I've got a strap around my waist tied to a sled that has my body weight on it, and I walk backwards. And a Cumulatively, throughout the week of July 12th, I'm going to walk backwards, pulling my body weight for 12 miles. And this has a very specific purpose behind that number. Each mile represents one month in the first year of freedom that is so hard for these women. I hope that you'll join me in working to end the cycle of exploitation as we move for Amira. At this time, I'm going to invite the band to come up and play some music for us. But let's go back to Nehemiah. There's something for us to pull from it. Nehemiah has moved to do justice on behalf of his people. And in the face of great opposition, insult, and threat, is working 
to rebuild the wall of defense around the city and restore a people to a place of belonging. And in spite of the great surrounding threat, Nehemiah prays to God and then continues to narrate and says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. And here's how we did it. The people worked with all their heart. What does it look like to do something with all your heart? By the way, this is something that's really important for us to think about because God says that we are to love him with all our heart. How is God calling you to love him and to work with all your heart? To do biblical justice with all your heart. Some of you in the room, uh, th this is all new information to you, and you're just trying to process the fact that this is going on all around us each and every day. And so my invitation for you is here in a moment when we pray that you would just process that with the Lord and ask him, Lord, do you want me to respond? Are you calling me to do tzedakah on behalf of of the oppressed women in the world. And some of you already know, oh man, I am called to be a part of this. And the question you need to ask God is, God, how? How much? How much can I give? How can I serve? Let's pray. Lord God, Thank you for your gospel of justice, your heart for the oppressed, that you do not leave us where we are, that you sent Jesus to restore us to a right relationship with you. Let us seek to do biblical justice with all our hearts. Now in this time, just... Whichever camp you're in, or maybe a third category I didn't mention, just pray and ask God, how do you want me to respond? Thank you, Lord. It's all for your glory.